Okay, welcome everyone to the Royal Astronomical Society. My name is Lucinda Offer. I'm one of the Education Outreach Officers here. I uh, thank you for coming to December's public talk. It's been um, an ongoing thing since uh, JWST, the James Webb uh, Space Telescope launched in Christmas that um, for the last three years, this is our third year doing so, having an update on how the telescope is doing. Uh, so we are happy to um, have uh, Dr. Naomi Rowe Gurney with us this evening. Um, and she is an equity, diversity and inclusion support officer here at the Royal Astronomical Society. And she's helping with a number of projects in astronomy, uh, in the astronomy sector. And she's also a research development manager for the UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology. And she just completed a contract as a planetary scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, working on the James Webb Space Telescope. So she has a, a research, she was a research coordinator for the JWST Solar System team, and her own research focus on the atmospheres of the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. Naomi also led a Hubble Space Telescope program designed to support ice giant JWST observations, and she obtained her PhD in 2021 from the University of Leicester. Throughout her PhD and postdoc, Naomi has used her past experience as a teacher to partake in significant science communication work and considerable equity, diversity, and inclusion work, promoting science to underrepresented groups. Please welcome Dr. Naomi Rowe Gurney. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for being here, both online and in person. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking to you about uh, the JWST, uh, its first two years. These first two years have gone uh, extremely quickly. I can't believe it's already been two years. Um, and I'll start with a little bit more about my career journey. Um, so I started my, uh, my career doing a four year integrated masters in physics of astrophysics at the University of Leicester. Then it ended up back in Leicester for my PhD. And my thesis was looking at the atmospheres of both Uranus and Neptune using the Spitzer Space Telescope, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Uh, and I got my PhD and moved out to the US uh, near to Washington DC in October of 2021. And uh, that was just before the JWST launched. And it was to do a postdoc at NASA Goddard, um, working directly with uh, the JWST, specifically the solar system teams. Uh, and I got back about two months ago, so in October of this year, and I now work here at RAS as an EDI officer, and I'm also working at the UK CEH, um, supporting research into environmental science. Um, so uh, because I have now transitioned into doing some Earth observations, so instead of looking out, looking in a little bit more, so um, this would probably be one of the last talks that I do about JWST, which is um, kind of sad, but um, also exciting to be the last one. So uh, what is the JWST? Let's start right at the beginning. Um, it's the largest and most powerful space telescope uh, we've ever created and um, the biggest one that we've ever sent to space. And it has a 6.5 meter primary mirror, so about three stories of a building. And uh, it's made up of 18 separate gold plated segments. Uh, and it has four scientific instruments that are all housed uh, behind the back of the mirror and they all look in infrared wavelengths. It also has a tennis court sized five layer sun shield uh, to keep it cool. And uh, it was mostly built for looking at distant astrophysical objects, so galaxies, stars, nebulas. Um, but very early on in its concept design uh, phase, scientists wanted to also be able to look at our own solar system, all objects in our solar system. And uh, the right image here shows uh, a very early concept design for the NGST, which it used to be called, or the Next Generation Space Telescope, um, from scientists that created it and designed it at Goddard. And uh, it shows a lot of similarities with the uh, JWST that we know today, including that large deployable mirror, uh, the open telescope design with that boom uh, that extends, uh, and also the large multi-layer sunshield. Uh, and it took a uh, worldwide collaboration between NASA in the US, the Canadian Space Agency in, uh, the, uh, in Canada, and then also the European Space Agency, uh, including the UK, um, to make this huge advancement possible. And the UK actually played a very big role in the structural design of the telescope, and also in uh, one of the instruments, which I'll talk about later, which sees in the mid-infrared. 
So a lot of people say that JWST is the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, but that would be a disservice to Hubble because when it comes to space telescopes, Hubble is still the most famous example. Uh, although JWST is catching up slowly, but the Hubble has been around a lot longer and it's still going strong today. Um, it was actually launched in 1990. It's about two months older than me. Um, and in that time, it's done over 1.5 million observations. Uh, and it's produced beautiful images of the solar system, like the ones I'm displaying here. And the animation shows just how big uh, both of these telescopes are. You can see there's a person there for scale. Uh, and uh, Hubble and JWST really complement each other. Even though JWST's mirror is five times bigger uh, than Hubble's, um, they both work in different wavelength bands. And uh, Hubble sees mostly in visible wavelengths, whereas the JWST looks at longer wavelengths that are beyond red in the spectrum. And these are called the infrared. And we experience the infrared as heat. So uh, JWST is almost like uh, a really expensive kind of night vision security camera. Um, it works in the same uh, wavelengths as one of those. And so if you split this image right down the center, everything on the left is the visible in Hubble and everything on the right is uh, infrared uh, JWST. So in the background, the images show the famous pillars of creation that show how we can look through the cold dust and gas using infrared to see those hot stars forming beneath it. And uh, for planetary science, this is useful because we can see through the hazes of atmospheres and we can also see different altitudes and features in the atmospheres with infrared. Um, we can see the features in the right-hand side of this Jupiter image that are either invisible or more difficult to see in the left, but both images have their uses and they're both useful for looking at different things. So another space telescope um, that used infrared was the Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, Spitzer was actually the predecessor to JWST. It was launched in the same generation of telescopes as Hubble, but it was in 2003 that it was launched. Um, and it was decommissioned in January 2020, just in time for JWST to take over in 2021. And it was an Earth trailing orbit, so following us around the sun. And it's very small compared to the other two telescopes, um, with a mirror less than a meter across, 0.85 meters. And for telescopes, um, it's always better to have a bigger mirror. Um, because a larger mirror means we can collect more photons. More photons means we can look at dimmer, smaller, colder, and more distant objects. And JWST's mirror has an area more than five, 45 times greater than Spitzer's, um, so much bigger. And uh, my favorite fact about uh, Spitzer is that the mirror size is actually almost exactly the same size as the secondary mirror on the JWST. So that mirror that's on the end of the boom that reflects light back into the instruments is the same size as the Spitzer primary mirror. Um, so we've really upgraded. And my PhD research used Spitzer to look at Uranus and Neptune in preparation for the JWST. So how does a space telescope like the JWST work? Um, it works like any telescope you would have um, yourself um, or one that you've seen working. Uh, it has the main job of looking at things that are very distant, looking at far away things. And JWST gathers light from these distant objects and focuses it into its multiple instruments um, that act as the eyes of the telescope. Um, and they're housed behind the mirror. And uh, those 18 gold hexagonal segments that make JWST um, so memorable um, are all able to move completely uh, independently so we can uh, adjust the focus remotely at any time. And once that light is focused into the instruments, uh, JWST stores that observational data. Um, and then we have to figure out how to get the JWST data back from JWST, which is a million kilometers away back to Earth. And that's where something called the Deep Space Network or DSN comes in. It's a number of huge dishes that are located all around the world and they receive that data. And then they send that data through to um, the Space Telescope Science Institute who process and store it so the scientists can access it. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the Space Telescope Science Institute because it plays a central role in JWST. It's located in uh, Baltimore, so just up the road from Goddard Space Flight Center in Washington, DC. And I already mentioned that they store and distribute the data that come down from the telescope. Um, it's also home to the JWST operation control room where it operates uh, the observatory and the instruments. And there's a picture of myself and my colleague Ian um, just outside the room last year. 
Um, because no matter how much you ask to go inside the JWST operation control room, they do not let you go in. <laughs> Um, so uh, space telescope scientists analyze a lot of the data. Um, they also produce a lot of the exciting uh, public release images you've probably seen. Um, and they also did a lot of the commissioning. So getting the telescope ready to do science. And I'll talk more about commissioning in a moment. So going back to the telescope itself, uh, the power of the JWST isn't just in the size of the mirror. It's also in the uh, power of the instruments and the quality of the instruments. And there are four instruments aboard, all housed in the ISIM or the um, Integrated Science Instrument Module. So we have the FGS NIRIS, uh, we have the Near Infrared Camera or NIRCAM, we have the uh, Near Infrared Spectrograph or NIRSPEC, and the Mid Infrared Instrument or MIRI. And these instruments provide imaging and spectroscopic capabilities across the whole spectral range. And um, the instruments that begin with the word near are, are in the near infrared, uh, closest to red in the spectrum, whereas MIRI is the only one working in the mid infrared, and that's at longer wavelengths. And I mentioned that the UK was very heavily involved in the mid infrared instrument. Um, and that's probably one of the most powerful ones that we have um, because it's the only one in this uh, very difficult to image range. And both MIRI and NERSPEC are very powerful because they do something called spectroscopy. So imaging is easier to talk about because um, our cameras on our phones do imaging, um, even our own eyes do imaging all the time. Um, but I'm going to talk a lot about spectra and spectroscopy as well because it's one of the most exciting aspects of JWST to scientists. So JWST has these six different spectroscopic modes, but the main principle behind all of them is the splitting up of light into different wavelengths. Um, so we measure how much light there is at each one of those wavelengths, and that gives us a spectrum like the plot you can see in the top. And this spectrum actually shows um, the kinds of molecules that may be detected in a star forming region, like um, the one shown, the Eagle Nebula. But the most exciting spectroscopic mode for solar system scientists is this IFU mode or integral field unit mode. And an IFU uh, means that we don't have to choose between whether we image something or use a spectrum, we can get both. Um, so each pixel in the image that you take has a spectrum that you can look at. Um, so we generate these um, kinds of image cubes because we have three dimensions of information, not just two anymore. Um, and it's very, very dense with information. And we'll see how useful that is uh, for solar system science in a moment. And it's hard to believe um, all of these pictures came out uh, more than a year ago, um, but they're very useful for reminding us about JWST's four major science themes and the whole reason that it was built in the first place. Um, so uh, objective one, uh, two and three. Um, so we've got first light, so looking at the early universe, we've got understanding galaxies, and we're also seeing through the dust and, uh, and gas to where stars are being born. Um, so all of that being more cosmological and um, astrophysical. And then we have um, this fourth um, objective. And when we think of planetary systems and the origin of life, um, a lot of people automatically go to thinking about exoplanets. Um, but there's no better way to understand how planetary systems work than by looking in our own backyard and seeing how our solar system works. And solar system science with JWST is a very large and important area, and around 7% of JWST's first year was dedicated to looking at our own solar system. So what in the solar system has JWST been looking at? Uh, it can observe everything from Mars out. Um, so planets, moons, asteroids, Kuiper Belt objects, uh, comets, and engineers had to overcome some obstacles to be able to make that possible. Um, so galaxies, stars, nebulas, they're all very distant. And when something's distant, it is relatively dim. Uh, it's also re relatively stationary on the night sky, whereas everything in the solar system is uh, relatively bright compared to that, and also it's moving on the night sky. Uh, and we had to make sure that JWST could track moving objects. And we also had to make sure that they don't break, uh, that, that none of the instruments break when they look at something bright. So they tested all this in the process of commissioning. Um, so commissioning is actually everything from launch all the way up until science. Um, so it took six months um, to get the telescope ready to do its job. 
Uh, and JWST had three phases of commissioning that happened over that time. So the first phase uh, was spacecraft commissioning, which meant launch, uh, deployment, and the beginning of cooling to operating temperatures. Then the second phase was telescope commissioning, so aligning the mirrors and all the other optics. And then the third phase was scientific instrument commissioning, so calibration and characterization of those four instruments. So the hardest and most nerve wracking part was definitely phase one. Um, phase one uh, gave a lot of scientists a lot of anxiety and, and engineers. Um, and the launch especially was very, very scary um, for a lot of people um, all around the world, including me. And uh, I mean, it's hard to believe that we're approaching that two year launch anniversary. Um, and this is a picture of me just before launch, um, very early in the morning in my pajamas. Uh, watching the live stream, uh, very, very anxious. Um, and it's a shame because uh, we were meant to go into the office and share our anxiety, um, but uh, because of a new strain of COVID, we all had to stay home. So everybody, um, uh, even like everyone at NASA Goddard um, was at home watching it in their pajamas. And, and all phases of the launch, thankfully, went off without a hitch, um, thanks to ESA and their Ariane 5 rocket. Um, which means actually that there's enough fuel for a mission lifetime of over 20 years, which is amazing. And uh, this lower right corner shows the last time that we could view the telescope before it started on its next journey. So it took an entire agonizing month of constant deployments to reach its home out at the L2 Lagrange point. Um, so L2 is a gravity well that JWST orbits. It's 1.5 million kilometers away or about a million miles away from Earth. And um, the biggest and most exciting day for me was when that secondary mirror deployment happened. Um, so that's when the boom comes out and that secondary mirror is finally in front of the primary mirror. Because up until that point, we couldn't even call JWST a telescope. If it can't reflect any light into the instruments, then it wasn't looking at anything. But as soon as that happened, it was a telescope. Even if we couldn't do anything else, it was going to, to, to be a telescope. Um, and then the second phase, um, which was the telescope commissioning or the mirror alignment, so it's 18 individual hexagonal mirror segments needed to work together as a high precision optical surface. And it had to focus that light into those four instruments. And the aim was to get the light uh, from a star as focused as possible, like the one on the image here. And uh, you can see the before and after mirror alignment selfies. So we can't take a photo of JWST, it being so far away, but it can take a photo of itself. Um, and we can see how important it was to be able to move those 18 segments uh, remotely and independently um, to achieve this level of focus and to make sure that we can always achieve this level of focus. So this image shows all four of the instruments uh, with their light successfully focused and ready for this last um, instrument commissioning phase to begin. So I was involved in a team uh, that did part of this process um, for solar system observers, um, and it was led by astronomers at the Space Telescope Science Institute. So we did two things that are important for solar system observations. We did something called MT or moving target testing. Um, so make sure JWST can track objects moving quickly. And we also did something called scattered light testing, which makes sure that the instrument doesn't break when it looks at something bright. So the first uh, thing that we did was moving target testing. So when observing objects in the solar system, JWST has to do a very complicated process. It has to move the observatory uh, and change its pointing direction relative to the background guide stars during the observation. Um, so something in the solar system is just constantly moving. So we have to track it. Um, and JWST can only track something uh, so fast, but we didn't know how fast it could do it. Um, so we tested this capability by observing asteroids of different apparent speeds uh, using each instrument to see what their capabilities were. And these images are some of the asteroids that we uh, observed. Um, so our initial speed limit or the, the limit that we initially thought JWST could handle um, was 30 milliarc seconds per second, um, which is the speed unit that we use. And you can see uh, the asteroid in the middle um, is traveling at 67 milliarc seconds per second, so over twice that limit. And you can see in the bottom left quadrant of, of that animation, you can see a point of light that doesn't move. 
that's the asteroid and that's how we we know we can track it because that's the background stars moving as it moves so we're successfully tracking it and as a result we managed to increase the speed limit for future observations and i'll show a great example of that in a moment so the other type of testing was scattered light testing so we wanted to answer some fundamental questions what happens if the telescope looks at a bright source uh, can all the functions still work uh, will all the instruments still produce images? Um, how close can we look at something that's close to one of these bright objects? Um, so we tested all of these questions and happened to get these Jupiter images. And this was the first time that uh, we managed to image a planet with JWST and it absolutely shocked everyone because these rings are not easy to observe. And here we did it with just an instrument test. So uh, it was a really great science, uh, sign of the, the planetary science to come. So we usually split the solar system into two distinct areas, uh, planetary systems, um, so the planets uh, and also their rings and moons, and then everything else is small bodies. Um, so asteroids, comets, dwarf planets like Pluto, and during my time at Goddard, I was supporting the uh, planetary system science teams, um, so everything on the left. And my colleague Ian, who I showed you in that, in that image, he was supporting everything small bodies. Um, so studying these objects, like all of these objects, is important for answering some really fundamental questions about the entire universe. Um, small bodies, for example, are of huge scientific interest because they're leftovers from the formation of the solar system. And they likely contain answers about how our, our solar system and Earth itself was formed. Um, they may even give us a clue to the origins of life on Earth. So lots of big questions. And studying planetary systems is also really important um, because we can get a better understanding of how different types of planets formed um, throughout the universe, exoplanets. Um, we want to know about their surfaces and their atmospheres, their composition, their clouds, their weather. Um, we also want to look at their rings and moons to better understand their formation and their evolution. And we're always looking for signs of life anywhere we can. Um, and I'll be going through all of these examples in detail on our journey through the solar system. So on our journey, uh, we're going to start from here on Earth, or at least close by at JWST, uh, and slowly make our way out through the different objects that JWST has observed over these last two years. So this diagram isn't a scale at all. And I'm gonna talk in terms of AU or astronomical units um, when I talk about distances from the sun. Um, so one AU is equivalent to uh, 93 million miles um, or the average distance of um, the earth and the sun. Um, so earth is at one AU uh, and uh, JWST being around one million miles from earth is also around one AU. So the closest objects to Earth that we can observe with JWST are near-Earth objects. And a small body is considered an NEO or a near-Earth object only when it's at around 1.3 AU or closer. So a great example is the asteroid system of Didymos and Dimorphos. Um, so Dimorphos is orbiting around the larger Didymos. And JWST wanted to observe these two rocks in particular because they were the target of the double asteroid redirect test or the DART mission. And DART's aim was to check if we can alter the trajectory of an object in case something ever comes towards Earth. Um, so planetary defense. So DART was crashed into the smaller Dimorphos. And this is an image time-lapse on the right um, of around five hours that shows the impact of DART from JWST. So this was a huge feat for us in the moving target um, testing team because DART was traveling at 110 milliard seconds per second, which is over three times that initial speed limit we thought we needed to um, stick to. So it was only after that extensive testing that we did that, um, that this was made possible. Another important milestone was hit with DART. Um, it marked the first time that JWST and Hubble simultaneously observed the same target. Um, so the images in blue are Hubble and the red one is JWST. So the two back ones, background ones, they happened at exactly the same time. And then the one in the front was taken 12 days after the impact. And this uh, front image helped scientists to come to the conclusion that the mission worked and uh, that we did alter the orbit of Dimorphos. 
And scientists are also really interested in that um, kind of uh, comet tail that's come off it because that's all of the debris that's come from that um, impact. Um, so they're interested in how that debris moves in space and they're also interested in what it's composed of to better understand what's happening inside objects like these. It's not every day that we get to uh, smash um, something expensive into a rock. <laughs> Um, so this marks humanity's first time purposely changing the motion of a celestial object and the first full-scale demonstration of asteroid deflection technology for planetary defense. So a big thing that I'm really happy that JWST could help out with. So let's continue our journey. We're now at 1.5 AU from the sun, at our closest planetary neighbor, Mars. And we have a lot of landers and orbiters at Mars, um, so it is very extensively observed, but we need JWST to kind of take a step back and be able to take a global perspective to understand what's happening um, in the atmosphere and on the surface. Um, so JWST took these maps back in September last year. And this left image shows a, a surface reference map uh, with the two near cam field of views over the top. And the near infrared images are on the right. So Mars is one of the brightest objects that JWST is allowed to look at. Um, anything brighter and it's gonna break. Um, so it was an amazing achievement to get images and not just have um, white squares um, with it all just um, saturating. Um, so it was uh, a big deal to be able to, to get these. Uh, and we used near spec instrument as well to do spectroscopy at Mars. And that told us about the dust and the icy clouds and what kind of rocks are on the planet's surface and also the composition of the atmosphere. So traveling out from Mars, we hit uh, the asteroid belt between two and three AU, which is home to most of the asteroids in the solar system. It's also home to one of the dwarf planet series and a handful of the most exciting main belt asteroids have been observed with JWST, but only one so far has made the news. And that's because it was extremely small. It was actually during commissioning that scientists noticed something photobomb their MIRI test images. Um, so they realized this, this thing that photobombed was um, not just a, a pixel that had got in the way, it was actually a 100 to 200 meter diameter uh, rock um, which is teeny tiny um, and one of the smallest ever detected in the main belt. So JWST does amazing things even when it's by accident. And uh, asteroids are made of metals, rocks, uh, and whereas comets are mostly ice and dust and they have that characteristic coma or tail. And comets aren't usually found in the main belt because it's warm and ice melts. And we thought uh, water ice would definitely not be there. Um, but main belt comet 238P Reed um, shows us something completely unexpected. So on the left is an artist's illustration of what it might look like with all that ice and dust uh, vaporizing due to the heat of the sun at this uh, AU. And on the right is an actual GWST image and spectrum. So the image shows us that distinctive uh, halo and tail that a comet has. And the spectrum shows us that there is water vapor present. So it is water uh, and it is still in the main belt uh, and it is a comet. Um, so scientists are still trying to figure out how this kind of thing can exist. So we've already seen a lot and we've only made a dent so far in the whole solar system. Um, we just left the asteroid belt at three AU and um, we're entering into the outer solar system now. So the home of the giant planets. And our next stop is Jupiter. Jupiter is at a distance of just over five AU, um, so five times the distance of Earth from the sun. So Jupiter is one of the brightest and most challenging objects to observe with JWST because it's so big. And a team of uh, scientists called the ERS team or the Early Release Science Team have the very difficult job of testing all of the instruments and modes on Jupiter, uh, Jupiter's whole system, to test JWST's science capabilities in the solar system. Um, so they have a lot of data to go through, um, and uh, this is where that uh, these images are where that's come from. And uh, they also work closely with citizen scientists like Judy Schmidt, who processed these images herself, and they were deemed so amazing that NASA used them in uh, the press release that they used for Jupiter. 
And the team have been characterizing uh, Jupiter's cloud layers, winds, composition, temperature structure, and even its auroral activity. You can see the aurora there at the uh, north and south pole in orange. And uh, they've also characterized the rings and are looking closely at moons as well. So recent science by that team uh, used the high resolution imaging of the NIRCAM instrument. Um, so they were able to track individual jets at different altitudes inside this newly discovered jet stream feature. So in that white box, you can see um, a bright band, that's a newly discovered jet stream. And by tracking them, they found out that this new jet stream travels at about 320 miles per hour. And that's about twice the speed that winds have to be to be categorized as a category five hurricane on Earth. So massively um, strong winds. And this work was published in Nature Astronomy just in October, so about two months ago. So all of this um, science is still very much ongoing, even though a lot of their data came from the first year. So another recent publication was about Europa. Europa is a special type of moon called an ocean world. Uh, and we call it that because we think that under a great crust of ice, ocean worlds have this deep subsurface water ocean. And uh, it may have the capacity to contain some kind of life. So uh, when JWC observed Europa, it detected carbon dioxide um, in a specific region on the icy surface. And they linked it, they think, from the subsurface ocean. Uh, so the graphic here shows a map of Europa's surface with NIRCAM, uh, so that's in the first panel, and then compositional maps from the NIRSPEC uh, IFU in the next three panels. And the white pixels here correspond to carbon dioxide in different forms. And so we, we humans are carbon-based life, so any detection of carbon on other worlds, especially when um, it's a world that we know also has water on it, um, it's a great sign that the environment might be habitable to life as we know it. Um, so um, the ocean worlds are very, very exciting for a lot of scientists. So then we have the other larger moons of Jupiter. So Ganymede, um, the largest Galilean moon uh, that's on the left, and Io on the right is the most volcanically active. So the top images here are some close-ups from a couple of missions, so the Galileo and Juno missions to Jupiter. Uh, and the bottom images are from JWST. So the ERS team also have been observing these moons. And uh, this is a spectroscopic map of Ganymede showing light absorption around the poles. And that's characteristic with a molecule called hydrogen peroxide. And we think that that comes from uh, charged particles around Jupiter and Ganymede that impact the ice that covers the moon. So it can tell us about the magnetic field. And uh, that's, this is an infrared uh, image of Io showing um, several ongoing hot volcanic eruptions. So these bright features here are actually volcanic eruptions happening right now as we observe it. And it's the first time they've been able to link a volcanic eruption to these forbidden transitions of uh, gaseous sulfur monoxide. So going out to 9.5 AU, we arrive at Saturn. You might be able to see it slightly better on the TV screens, people in the room, rather than the uh, the one, the big one. And this dear cam image is targeting the whole Saturn system. Um, so we can look at the rings, the smaller moons, and also the atmosphere. And although the Cassini spacecraft observed the atmosphere from closer up, this is the first time that we're able to look at this particular wavelength, so 3.23 microns. And that wavelength is unique to JWST. And scientists have been using MIRI also to figure out why there's that dark feature at its North Pole, which you might be able to see on the screens. Uh, and uh, they're also using long exposures of this image to look at the fainter, more diffuse rings. And, and like Jupiter, Saturn also has some really interesting moons, including my favorite moon, Titan. And it's my favorite moon because it's the only moon in the solar system where there is a dense atmosphere and it's the only body where there are rivers, lakes, and oceans, like on Earth, but instead of being made of water, they're made of methane. So Titan had this amazing press release with these two left images from JWST NIRCAM. And on the left one, uh, it shows one filter highlighting the atmosphere, and on the right, it shows a composite of different filters. And um, we can see clouds, uh, and the albedo changes on the surface, uh, and 
Bracken Mare, for example, is thought to be a methane sea, and Belet is thought to be composed of dark colored sand dunes. And so after seeing the clouds, especially, scientists wanted to look again to see what maybe changed over some number of hours because clouds are dynamic and change all the time. And uh, it really helps to see how they change. So after 30 hours, um, they used the Keck telescope, which is a large ground-based telescope in Hawaii, um, to look at Titan as well. So this right image is from that observation and shows that the clouds are still there but they've changed shape a bit and they've also um, changed relative to uh, the moon. So this will help scientists try and figure out why Titan is so unique in the solar system. So another one of Saturn's large moons is Enceladus. So we put it in the same group as Europa as being one of these extremely interesting ocean worlds. And scientists using JWST recently discovered this giant plume and it's jetting out from the south pole of Enceladus. Um, and we think it's because of this subsurface ocean that's there. So this jet extends uh, for more than 40 times the size of the moon itself. So it's a huge jet. And this animation shows how the plume feeds the moon's torus um, and supplying the rest of the Saturnian system with water. And how do we know it's water? And that's where the IFU comes in. So we use the uh, near spec IFU um, and we isolate the pixels um, that have the plume. So highlighted here in purple um, and you can see the spectrum where the purple is. Um, and when we extract that spectrum, um, we see these obvious water features. So um, the, the bumps here are, are water features. And that's how we now suspect a lot more water than we initially thought in the Saturn system comes from these Enceladus plumes and leaves this giant water donut around the planet. So in irregular orbits between Jupiter and Neptune, you sometimes get these weird things called centaurs. Um, and they're half comet, half asteroid, like a mythological uh, centaur is half human and half horse. Um, so past Saturn, but before we reach our ice giants, we run into the centaur Chariclo at around 13 to 18 AU. And what was so special that we wanted to look at this particular rock with JWST? Um, it's because it went through something called an occultation and also that it might only be 160 miles across, but it's got rings. Um, so an occultation is a type of eclipse uh, where an object travels between us and a star, and it allows us to measure the light from the block star to find out more about the object. It's a lot like how we study exoplanets. And uh, the left video here shows Chariclo moving across the star that's in the center. And the right graphic shows what happened to that star's light. Um, so it was a very, very close call, but unfortunately we, we didn't quite get Chariclo itself but we did get its two rings. Um, so we were just a hair off. And this is really redefining the different classes of small bodies in the solar system because um, these things can have moons and um, multiple ring systems, um, which is um, really complex for such a small feature. So out at 20 AU, we finally hit my favorite planet, Uranus. And it's my favorite because it is um, the weirdo of the solar system. Um, it's weird because it's the only planet tilted on its side, and it also appears to be much colder than it should. So it contains a lot of mysteries, um, especially when we compare it to Neptune. So this is a two-color composite from February of this year, um, and it looks at the planet for a total of just 430 seconds. And that's actually because um, this observation failed. Um, this was uh, supposed to be just like the Neptune one, which I'm about to show, but um, there was a problem with one of the guide stars and we only got 430 seconds instead of um, the usual few minutes that we wanted, um, tens of minutes that we wanted. So um, we looked uh, at it for only four, 430 seconds, but we still see rings, moons, clouds, all beautifully clearly. And, and there's still a lot of science to be get done with these images. And look out in the future for uh, more Uranus images because, uh, you know, I heard there might be some coming soon. 
So we can get hints of the kinds of exciting things to expect from future data. If we zoom into this a bit, we can see the blurs in a lot of places where we expect to see the smaller moons. Uh, and uh, scientists are also excited to look at detail in the rings to try and observe um, these more distant faint rings. And we see a lot of detail in the atmosphere as well. Um, so here on the right, you can see there's a cloud, there's cloud features that tells us a lot about circulation and weather and also deep chemistry. And that faint polar structure that you can just about see um, is usually it needs a lot of exposure time to view um, with other telescopes. But here we're seeing it even with a, a dud observation, we're seeing that. Um, so it, it is amazing that we're able to see it in such a short exposure. And that wasn't actually the first time we looked at Uranus with JWST. Um, more observations happened with the MIRI and the near spec uh, instruments beforehand in January. Um, and it's annoying that I can't share anything with you right now, but um, I can share these models that we generated before launch. So this allowed us to plan ahead for the actual data analysis. And we generated these synthetic data cubes. Um, so from MIRI IFU in the same resolution and wavelength of that MIRI IFU. And the right image here is part of an example data cube of Uranus. Uh, and each pixel in that image has an associated spectrum like the one above. And spoiler alert, it looks very, very similar to the real data. Um, when I first saw the real data, I thought I'd accidentally clicked one of these models. And uh, we might lose some spatial resolution when uh, we uh, gain this spectral resolution um, with the IFU. Um, so it's not as crisp and clear as those near cam instrument uh, images, but we make up for it by uh, getting all of the spectral information. And also uh, we've used Hubble and also large ground based telescopes like Keck um, to look at Uranus in the visible and near infrared at around the same time. So we always know that we're gonna have an image that we can look at to kind of compare things if we don't have the spatial resolution to look at it with these cubes. And using Hubble and Keck at the same time, as well as JWST was a very, very successful campaign and the science is coming very soon. Not by me. <laughs> and if we keep going, uh, we get out to Neptune at 30 AU. So this was the first time we pointed JWST at an ice giant. Um, so it was the most exciting day for me in this past year. And you can see Neptune with its amazing rings and its largest moon, Triton. And with the planet on the background of galaxies, you really get a sense of scale of the whole universe. And these images were taken as an outreach only program, just like the Uranus ones were. Um, so they're not for science purposes, um, but they're just to showcase what the near cam instrument can do uh, for looking at these amazing planets. And I was uh, lucky to be the subject matter expert for this um, and the Uranus image as well. Um, so I worked with the Space Telescope Science Institute to get them ready for public release. So let's look a bit closer. And remember, we're all the way out at 30 AU. So the time it takes for Neptune to go around the sun is 164 Earth years. Um, and it's so distant that um, the seasons take so long to happen that in the advent of modern telescopes, we haven't actually been able to observe the North Pole of Neptune. We've never seen the North Pole. So uh, when I first saw this image, I didn't think I was even looking at Neptune because we hadn't seen the rings like this. I thought it was looking at Saturn. Um, we hadn't seen the rings like this since we flew by in the 1980s with Voyager 2. And we're clearly seeing seven of eight of the moons that are in the field of view as well. And in the atmosphere, we can also see a lot of features uh, and also Triton. Triton is Neptune's largest moon in that top corner. And it's actually considered a small body rather than uh, a, a natural moon because we think it's a captured object from the Kuiper belt. So that was Ian's problem, not mine. So some other details you may have missed in these. Um, not only can we see the rings, we can also see um, what we see as the ring arc. So in that top left-hand corner, there's like a brightening of the ring. And these are clumps of dust and rock um, that travel around the planet like a moon does, um, but they appear like a brighter clump in the rings. You can also see the uh, faint inner gal ring that's um, very difficult to observe, but we're again seeing it in a very short exposure. And then you've got Niad, which is one of the moons, one of the smaller moons. It's only 60 kilometers in diameter. 
And remember, we're looking at 30 AU distance here, and we're seeing an object that is 60 kilometers in diameter with just 430 seconds of exposure time. And the right images here show uh, the atmosphere in two different wavelengths, where the brighter areas are looking uh, at methane clouds, so reflected sunlight, and the darker areas are looking deeper at methane emission. And scientists are using these images to do science, even though that they were just meant for outreach, because you just can't stop scientists from doing science. So we just passed Neptune, and now we're into the domain of the small bodies. So from 30 AU out, we're in the Kuiper Belt. So the Kuiper Belt extends uh, 30 to 55 AU and contains the Kuiper Belt objects or the trans-Neptunian objects as they're sometimes known, KBOs or TNOs. And KBOs are much colder and further away than asteroids and comets uh, near the main belt. And this makes them harder to observe, but it also makes JWST's capabilities the most advantageous for them. Um, and there's a lot of JWST time that was devoted to Kuiper Belt objects and will be devoted to Kuiper Belt objects in the future. This picture here shows a size comparison of the largest known Kuiper Belt objects compared to Earth and the Moon. Uh, most of the known dwarf planets, uh, the most famous being Pluto and its largest moon, Charon. Uh, and a lot of these on this diagram here have been observed by JWST. And I honestly completely lost count. I don't know how Ian did his job because um, over 80 different Kuiper Belt objects have been observed already. At least I only had to deal with a few planets. <laughs> um, and this has allowed scientists to start classifying them in different ways. So uh, they are able to gain information about their different colors, uh, their sizes and their compositions and put them into separate categories, which they've never been able to do before. And I can't leave you without mentioning the most exciting thing that's happening in the future, um, which is the Uranus Orbiter and Probe. Um, the Uranus Orbiter and Probe was prioritized by the Planetary Decadal Survey. And this hopefully in the future will be the first dedicated mission to an ice giant planet because we've only visited um, both ice giants with Voyager 2 in these two fleeting flybys. And that's the first and last time that we visited. And so the ice giants are the last unexplored class of planet in the solar system. And this is an example of an ideal timeline. And by ideal, I mean extremely optimistic and incredibly surreal. Um, but if we start the development next year, <laughs> that only gives us seven years until launch because we want to take advantage of um, something called a Jupiter assist where we can uh, find where Jupiter is and, and kind of slingshot around it. And that would mean that we would only need a 13 year journey to get out to 20 AU. And we'd arrive in the system around the 2040s. Um, so it is it's distant in the future, but if they start soon, then it will be sooner. And so scientists met up recently in California um, to discuss um, the science and engineering needed for a mission like this. Um, and hundreds of scientists and engineers showed up to this um, from around the world. And it really shows that the science uh, community is really behind um, doing something like this. Um, and so look out for any mention of it in the in the years to come and mention it to your friends and family so um, we can hype it up. So yeah, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and I look forward to your questions. One, two, one, two. Thank you so much. We're going to take questions in the room. And we have a question that's waiting online as well. And of course, if you're on YouTube, you can ask any questions. Um, any questions in the room? We have uh, the lovely Nancy here who's going to help out with questions in the room. One thing I did want to say was, um, if you don't know that, um, uh, the family, the Herschels, uh, John Herschel, who co-founded the Royal Astronomical Society, uh, made his father, his aging father, William Herschel, who was our first president. And it was William Herschel who discovered the planet Uranus. It was. With a seven foot telescope that he built himself and then went on to build a 40 foot telescope in Slough. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Any questions, please let Nancy know. Um, do we have a question?
I wondered what the theories are of why Neptune is uh, Uranus is sideways compared to everybody else. Yeah, great question. So um, the main theory, which is usually the theory they use when they don't know anything and, and they don't know what to say, is it got hit by something really big. Um, so we think that early on in its formation, um, something like planet size hit it and kind of turned it inside out. Um, and that turned it on its side and also released all of its internal heat, which explains why it's in a weird um, angle and also explains why it's colder than we expect. Um, so that's the main theory. But there are other theories out there. Um, when you say like number of rings, I was wondering what you meant because see how you said like there was the assassin had like the I think it was A, B, and C rings. Mm -hmm. What do you like? How do you classify like one ring? Or is it like is it like a stretch or is it just a singular? Good question. Good question. So um, I I don't know how they decided in the beginning, but usually um, if it looks the same kind of opacity, so you can see through it the same amount. Um, all the way, then they'll class that as one ring. Um, whereas if, um, so sometimes a ring can be like at the edge of another ring. So maybe like at Saturn, I think there's one that um, it has a bright edge. So they will call that bright edge a different ring to the ring that's attached to. So honestly, I don't know how they decided how to do it, but um, it's a great question. I have about three questions online, so the people in the room can start thinking about their questions once I'm done. How about I go through those two? Well, one one anonymous uh, viewer from Zoom says um, they're watching with their 10-year-old and think that you are an inspiration to her. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, okay, uh, don't make me cry. Um, on Zoom, <laughs> on Zoom, we've got Peter here who asks, um, will the JDBC data be made available for the public, such as... Um, uh, for example, a non-institutions related citizen scientist, for instance. Sorry, say that again. Will um, any of the JWST data be made available for the public, for instance, like to do citizen science? Yes. Um, so actually a lot of, so the, the, the program that I was working for was something called um, the GTO program or the Guaranteed Time Observation Program. And all of that data was open access. Um, so as soon as it comes down from the telescope and gets processed by Space Telescope, maybe like 24 hours after it's observed, it's available online and you can download it. You just have to go to, um, there's a repository of all of the JWST data on something called MAST, the M-A-S-T, and you can download everything from there. You, you just need to uh, figure out the file formats and um, kind of read up a little bit. And you, but you can use things like Python, which is very easily accessible to kind of play around with them. So it is very, very accessible to the public and to citizen scientists. Wonderful. A um, question from YouTube. Matthew Henson asks, uh, what do we achieve for the James Webb Telescope? Explain why we need to achieve this goal. So why, why, why? Why the just why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I would say um, just like why Hubble. Like we always want to kind of look at distant objects, and those four main science goals that I explained were um, the why of JWST. And I think it was mostly built, especially in the infrared, because um, when you're looking at these um, distant uh, galaxies, and we want to look as far. Uh, as far away as possible, you are looking back in time. And um, as the universe is expanding, um, you have red shift, um, which means things moving away appear redder. And if you go past red, uh, because you're moving so fast and you're so distant, you end up in the infrared. So that's why you need the infrared capabilities of JWST if you want to go further and look deeper into the universe. So that was one of the main uh, science goals of JWST. And we're just happy to tack on some solar system science. <laughs> like both uh, Naomi and myself, we, um, I'm a secondary teacher and from California originally. I remember talking about JWST back in 2004 Ooh. to my students, which is why I'm, you know, you're saying your timeline for the Uranus probe, mm -hmm. which is almost over mm. 20 years. And that's really how long it takes to get these. And you're saying that's very, you know, <laughs> <spinny. Yes. laughs> Yeah, exactly. My, um, my boss um, back when I worked uh, for JWST, 
Heidi Hamill, um, she had worked with JWST since the beginning. So like going on 25 years of JWST. So uh, the level of anxiety I had on launch day, I can't even imagine what she was going through. Yeah. Uh, last question here from Zoom, and of course, we'll then go back to the audience in, in house. Uh, Peter Herbert asks, what is the lifespan of the JDBST? Okay, great question. Um, so I explained before about um, the fuel capacity. So the fuel is a limiting factor in the telescope itself because we need fuel to be able to adjust uh, where it looks. Um, so it's not a telescope unless you can point it at something to look at. Um, so when the fuel runs out, the JWST um, can no longer work. Um, so because ESA managed to launch it so efficiently, we have over 20 years of fuel. Um, and uh, so we wanted the JWST to at least last five years. Um, that was in the plan. And then with an option to extend it to 10. And now we're looking at being able to use it for up to 20, as long as nothing else in the telescope fails. But it, it won't be the fuel that's the limiting factor. So fingers crossed for over 20 years of service. My question's not like entirely to do with this, but um, more of a question towards you. Yes. Um, do you think it was particularly difficult, like your journey to where you are now? Because you basically have like my dream job ever. So. <laughs> yeah, so um, what was it hard to get there? It was, it was. I've had a very um, a strange career path. When I left university, um, I was sick of physics. Um, I didn't want to do it anymore. So that's why uh, I took a break for five years and became a teacher. I actually escaped and went to China <laughs> to do it because <laughs> I hate physics that much. I had to go to a different continent. Um, but then when I became a physics teacher, um, I fell in love with it again because you, as a teacher, you kind of get the confidence like, oh, if I can teach other people this stuff, then I must know it. <laughs> and so that gives you the confidence. And that's what made me go into the PhD again. Because I actually, I got a 2-1 at university, not a first. And a lot of the um, like PhD like applications say, oh, you need to have a first. Like you need to be the top of your subject. Like you need to be the best. Like you don't. Um, you don't have to be smart to be a PhD student. You just have to be like dedicated and love the subject that you study. That's it. Um, so um, yeah, I had, I had a lot of like ups and downs in my career, but uh, once I like found my path, um, it was okay. And I'm still kind of wibbly winding cause I'm now going into um, uh, environmental science. So, you know, I'm still figuring out. <laughs> Someone else on Zoom, David Wright asks, Turn the JWST onto the Oort cloud. You mentioned the Kuiper belt, but what about the Oort cloud, which is moving by the waves further out? <laughs> Good question. Yes, the Oort cloud is very, very distant, and we don't have a lot of objects that we can that, that we know exist in the Oort cloud. So the problem with um, searching for new things with JWST is it's a waste of time. Um, we can't use the time that everybody wants. So this telescope, only one person can use it as, at a time and it's one telescope. And um, so there's lots of competition for time. So uh, we can't use it to search for these objects um, that we don't know exist. So um, that's kind of why we haven't looked at the Oort cloud much, but I think there, is, there are plans in the future to um, try and observe objects there. Any other questions in the room? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Naomi, for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for being with us. I just want to also let you know that um, we will be back with public talks in January. We're going to talk about poetry and science communication. That will be online only. Um, so we are kind of trying to get people into the building, but also being very flexible with online. And we thank you, Dr. Naomi Rogener, for being here with us in person. Thank you. Thank great. you again. Thanks. Sorry, guys. I think we have two more questions if we have time. Is that okay? Really quickly then. You can go ahead and I'll continue. Oh, you mentioned some of the images of the outreach versus for science. So yes. I know a bit more about the distinction between that. Yes, good question. So um the outreach images um are usually done by uh, Space Telescope Science Institute <laughs> rather than by um scientists um that are dotted around the world. Um, they're specifically to showcase uh, the capabilities of uh, the instruments, et cetera. Um, and 
The differences are that um, they're usually the images are kind of locked down and um, they're private and you can't actually access them. But as soon as they appear public, then they might as well be science images. Um, they also uh, tend to uh, pick the filters of the science images. So they use Neocam because Neocam is the prettiest. Um, and then they also pick the filters that look the best. They don't they don't care about what the science is behind each filter, which is what scientists have to, to kind of do, like, oh, what will be visible in each one. They're just trying to get the best color contrast so that it will look the best. And that's kind of like how they decide what to do for each one. I think you said that comments are entirely eyes, but the photograph, close-up photographs I've seen they look, they look to be rocky bodies to me with craters and boulders on them. Ice and, and dust, yeah, yeah. I, right? Ice and dust. Ice and so, dust. Yeah, yeah, lots of... I also once heard that if they discovered a comet was going to hit the Earth, there'd be nothing we could do about it because it would just plunge in and wipe out all life. But if comets are entirely made of ice, that's not a problem because obviously no matter how big it is, any ice would just evaporate in the atmosphere, wouldn't it? So are comets, in fact, not a danger to life on Earth? I think they are a danger still. I think um, comets are are still, uh, like ice is, is uh, solid. The dust that is in there is also, like, compacted. Um, well, dust would lot, dust and, like, turn to rock. a fine powder once the ice melts. By it dust, it means yeah. small rocks. So um, these small rocks are still could be quite large, but it's usually like a... Um, a conglomerate of uh, rock, dust, ice. So if a comet hit the Earth, would it do a lot of damage? I have no idea, probably. A big know? one, I'm sure. Sorry? A big one, I'm sure. A small one, I mean, um, they can, they probably would evaporate, but so does um, a, a small well, the asteroid. Just would just disperse and disintegrate. It wouldn't create a big... Like nuclear explosion by the time it hit the Earth, it reached the Earth. I have no idea. And it'd just be like tiny meteors that would probably burn up the atmosphere anyway. Yeah. Okay, so we're not in danger of comets, I don't think, anyway. Maybe we are. I don't know. Don't take my word for it. If there's a comet, please run. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if they tried to deflect a, a comet. That is, a, I don't know if they've um, thought about trying to deflect a comet or not, like they have with the DART mission. They could be lots of different sizes, comets. So. And with that, happy holidays, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> don't get hit by any comets. Have a wonderful winter break. <laughs> being here. Thank you again, Dr. Rogan. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Now, so you the building, and we have to do this. I'm going to go to the next one. 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 I'm going to go to the